Welcome to the podcast show by Kay Vandavani, The Total Connector, Total Bitcoin, Austrian Economics, the hardest and scarcest money ever created in human history, Bitcoin. Thanks to the awesome team of Hoddle Hall who organized the Baltic Honey Badger Conference 2019 in Riga. Um, I had a you know in-depth uh, talk about the essence, principles, uh, vision, ethos, mi- uh, you know future evolution of Bitcoin, critical mass adoption, privacy, security, trade-offs, user interface, user experience, user friendliness, but a, a spectrum of topics. Like, share, subscribe, uh, and and thank you so much for support. Let me know what you think. And again, thank you so much to the speakers and Bitcoiners and Bitcoin maximalists, Bitcoin realists. And yeah, I hope to do this again next year and in years to come. Thank you so much. Uh, Honey Badger Conference in Riga. It's so exciting. The sun's coming back. So let's go into Medias Res. Uh, Hus, um, what, do you, what do you take out of this conference so far? Um, the interactions, the conversations from yesterday till today. Uh, what are the mis- misconceptions and what, what's what's the ultimate thing that people need to know out there about Bitcoin? Uh, that it's a, hy- a hyperbolic statement I'm about to make. Uh, Bitcoin fixes everything. So uh, Bitcoin fixes this is a, is a very strong meme. And, uh, you know, there is a lot of misconceptions. Uh, not internally in the in the community. I uh, I'm loving being at this conference. My, it's, you know, I'm I'm here with my people, uh, and I, I suppose that's why all Bitcoiners uh, you know love coming to these conferences because it's uh, it's quite rare to find uh, like-minded people that uh, don't dismiss uh, Bitcoin because uh, they're too used to the the fiat drug. They love it. Right. So, um, you know, you're, you're passionate. There, there's a reason, there's a, you know, there's a root cause why we are so passionate. And so it goes blo- beyond belief. It, it's, it's, it's understanding and understanding means trust for me. We trust in Bitcoin, not because, you know, we, it's not a religion, it's not a dogma, it's not, you know, why, why, why is it that people still don't get it? And why is it that they don't feel yet the intuitive need to you know stack up on satoshis or bitcoin yet i think it's because uh it's very hard to unlearn things Mm. Uh, so when you've been getting taught the same lesson all your life and someone comes to you with a with a concept of bitcoin especially in the west they say you know why do i why do i need this like you know my money is never going to hyperinflate you know i can trust my government uh, and you know all that's well and good until you can't trust your government anymore and uh, history shows us uh, you know that governments are only temporarily trustworthy and then they they become a a, a beast and an animal onto themselves and uh, you know on your feet or on your knees freedom is just one of these and uh, you know if you if you want your freedom and you want to empower yourself uh, you know bitcoin is uh, is one of the one of your best tools to do that Mm -hmm. and unfortunately this is lost on a lot of westerners that haven't had that uh, life experience uh in you know living in living in the third world uh you know being uh being a victim of hyperinflation uh being victims of censorship uh so so that's why i think it's uh you know it's difficult for you know uh the click moment just isn't there for a lot of westerners Mm -hmm. Exactly. And you see, this is what I'm saying. I mean, uh, the people in Venezuela, Turkey, Iran, Argentina, whatever inflation, hyperinflation or censorship is happening, they feel the need, they feel the pain. But I think that's the ultimate challenge because they don't feel the pain over here in Western, or in Western countries, like I'm from Austria or wherever. Uh, West, it, the, the, the art of challenge is that it, um, how, do you, how do you make them understand what life, what the monetary, financial, economical, social life, or even scientific, technological evolution could be like in the few new, in the near future to come? Is, do you see that as a challenge? Like a huge challenge, yeah. uh, because uh, a lot of people just uh, just find it find it difficult to you know make make forward projections. Uh, like there were several experts, one Nobel Prize winning expert, uh, that said you know the internet. Well, it's not even going to be like that good. One of many, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one of one of many, many. So, 
a lot of people just don't have imagination. Uh, so, for example, like uh, the the best thing is the price volatility. So, Bitcoin's never going to work because it's too volatile. And basically, these people have zero imagination. Well, yeah, it's too volatile now, but that's that's the point. Like you know, it's not going to be it's not going to become a stable reserve currency in three years. Uh, like things just have to play out, and you just have to kind of open your mind, uh, suspend your disbelief for a bit. And uh, you know, think of think of future scenarios. But uh, but a lot of people uh, just uh, look. People have kids to feed, lives to run. Uh, so like they they don't ask themselves these mm -hmm. big you know philosophical questions about you know freedom, hard money, the future, mm -hmm. all of this kind of stuff. So you know, a lot of people are you know in their zone. Uh, but you know, once you fall down that rabbit hole, mm -hmm. the zone completely opens up. Exactly. So it's not only inspiration; it's really like on a comprehension level. It's it, we need to pick up, I guess, different people on different angles, right? Perspective. So, so you, you talked about freedom. You know, it, it's it's the essence of of, of Bitcoin freedom. Uh, definitely not just freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, uh, the essence is the monetization of energy. Yeah. So I see basically uh, uh, Bitcoin as just a, like a big battery that stores wealth uh, in the in the form of in the form of energy. So uh, energy secures uh, Bitcoin. Energy uh, gives Bitcoin a lot of its a lot of its value. Uh, so don't get that mistaken with you know whatever a Bitcoin costs to mine is the price. Right. Uh, the mining always follows whatever the the market price is. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know it's it's. It's uh, energy. And that's why it's called hard or hardest, scarcest money. Yeah. I think this is something, explain this in your own words. So uh, you, you, in nature, so I'm a, I'm a, mm -hmm. I'm a naturalist. Uh, uh, in nature, you can't create or destroy energy. You, mm -hmm. can, you can only really transfer it. Uh, so effectively, uh, you know, Bitcoin, uh, the monetization of energy, uh, compliant with the, with the laws of nature. And uh, typically speaking, uh, if you go against... Uh, nature, uh, you don't win, and uh, and that's that's where fiat uh, is uh, is currently running into a problem. Yeah. Uh, so they're creating effectively energy out of nothing by printing paper, and uh, you know you can have a dam, and you know the water level rises and it's about to break the dam, and, you know you can raise the dam a bit, but eventually the the river is going to win and uh, your dam is going to collapse. Uh, so effectively, don't don't fight nature, and you know, for me, like Bitcoin is almost a perfect representation of nature, mm -hmm. uh, especially in in its thermodynamic completeness. Energy can't be created or destroyed. Beautifully described. Anything else? Has I mean, what you think is is so crucial, so essential that people you know should at least do their own research on, or listen, or read maybe some you know article of yours or. Or whatever you know, do their own due diligence, sort of. Um, it's uh, for me. Uh, you mentioned you know, Bitcoin isn't a religion or a dogma or anything like that. No, for me, Bitcoin is a religion. Uh, it's and it's uh, it's very for me. It's uh, it's you know, very spiritual and uh, ethical, logical and ethical, ethical. And, and not just that. It's it's helped me uh, uh, free my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, a lot of times, you basically. Uh, you know, as gimmicky as this sounds, is you just gotta uh, look inside yourself, trust your heart, listen to yourself, and uh, once you've listened to yourself, ask, start asking yourself the questions: Can I trust this person? Can I trust that person? Uh, is this really valuable? Uh, am I going down the correct path in my life? And all that kind of stuff. And uh, the answers to all these questions, when you look deep down in your heart, uh, is hard money. Wonderful, uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful. <laughs> oh, so poetic. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, beautiful. So, where can people find you? Okay, so easiest way to find me is uh, is on Twitter at uh, at Hass McCook, and all of my all of my links to like my Medium pages, YouTube channel, all that kind of stuff, uh, you can find it there. Uh, you know, feel free to contact me directly on uh, on Twitter. I love a love a good old chat about Bitcoin, and uh, and yeah, thanks uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks so much, me on. To be continued. Oh, yeah. The Total Connect <laughs> says bye. Welcome to the Total Connect show. I'm here with Matt O'Dell, the legendary Matt O'Dell of the Tales of the Crypt. 
uh, with Marty Band, right? Absolutely. So uh, you guys are doing great job. I mean, great educational job. The last interviews I, I listened to also with Eric Vosquil yeah, was yeah, like was one. like amazing. Matt, I mean, let's just go into media, media's race. Um, what's what's the thing that's really right now at this critical juncture missing in the in the urgently necessary you know educational work and critical mass adoption of bitcoin i mean where, where do you see the challenges the obstacles or what what could be done better i mean i i don't know if we need anything like urgently um i you know i think like bitcoin is fine as it is right now uh and c compared to where we were in, you know, two years ago, three years ago, um, we're in a lot better situation than uh, we were then. Uh, you know, my, my two things that I've been focusing a lot on is privacy and lightning. Um, I think lightning really is going to help with privacy as well. Um, so with lightning right now, it's not very user friendly, right? It's getting more user friendly every day. Um, I, you know, I recently did a, like a walkthrough video with the Breeze wallet. Um, and that's a very user-friendly experience, but it's, you know, they, they make a lot of trade-offs to make that happen. So it's, you know, it's going to be, how do we balance those trade-offs? How do we make lightning as easy as possible? Um, so just like the average user can, can basically get onboarded really quickly, not know, uh, that they're even really using lightning, uh, you know, from like fiat to, to, to lightning and in, in a couple of minutes. And there's there's a lot of there's a lot of good developments happening there because you know, there's a there's a lot of business opportunity for people to uh, if if they can do it right right like if a company can can get that process down um, there's a lot of money to be made mm -hmm. so I'm like pretty optimistic uh, in in that respect and in just in general I think you know Lightning has progressed way way faster and and uh, better than I expected I was like I, me personally I was like kind of a a Lightning bear. You know, I, my, the first time I really used Lightning was in January of this year, mm -hmm. which is pretty crazy to think about, uh, especially as someone who's, you know, so involved in the space. Uh, even I am you know, relatively new to Lightning. So this next year, this next two years for Lightning should be should be huge. You know, in this uh, uh, back to this, you know, uh, hodling, and you, 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 you guys um, sort of um, uh, created this legendary meme of st stacking sack, uh, staying humble, stacking sats. I mean, there's an essence to this uh, whole thing, right? I mean, because in this monetary evolution phase of store of value, um, what what I, what my wish, what my dream, a personal wish would be, is that you know, um, I know a lot of people. I'm, I'm helping them, whatever, with a hardware wallet, uh, Trezor. But even you know, after so many times, it's 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 not. It ain't easy, you know. Like whether they're 40 years, 60, 70 years old, after like 10th time, you know, I still have to explain to them what steps to take. You know, generate new address, like really right. simple steps. My wish would be like a super like simple easy user friendly intuitive package with you know a full node eventually you know the coin mixing coin join or whatever you call it do you see that coming like plug and play thing where you just give it to them for christmas and like hey there you go you you know you got the hardest and scarcest money you know stacking up yeah i mean i i think you know, like I said earlier, I think that there's a lot of business opportunity to make that happen. So we see, you know, we see companies like Casa, who's like trying to create like a full stack uh, with with the node and the wallet and the multi sig. You know, Do you think it's affordable? I'm sorry to interrupt. Is well, it? You know, but Casa, yeah. what a Casa node's like three hundred dollars. Like it could, it could be. It's like a little bit underpowered, but they like. They but they have a subscription fee of three hundred dollars per year. No, 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 no. The subscription fee is for the multi sig. Um, okay. So that, that's not necessarily ideal, but like then you also have stuff like Samurai. They're doing a full stack. Like the mm -hmm. full stack makes a lot of sense, right? Where you mm -hmm. sell a node, they're doing it with Noddle. They sell a node, they have an app. It's, it syncs to the app. They have the mixing built into it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, the privacy elements will always be, I think, way more difficult. Like try and use the internet privately yeah. is a very difficult thing. It's yeah. not ever gonna. I don't know if that'll ever be user friendly. Um, you know, we'll see. I, that, that'll always be the hardest, the hardest part. But in terms of actually, you know, stacking sats, securing the sats, you know, operating it through your own full node, I think you know that gets easier every day. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm pretty optim I'm pretty optimistic about that. You know, I, I 
I'm currently involved with two companies. Uh, you know, full disclosure, I'm an advisor to both of them. You know, I get a little bit of equity. Uh, give Bitcoin and Bottle Pay. And name it. Yeah, Bottle. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a great project. Yeah. yeah, and both of those, right? The idea is let's make that user process as simple as yeah. possible, right? Let's make the gifting process as super, uh, you know, super easy, and uh, the actual using process super easy. And then the next step, right, is to try and graduate them to the yeah. to the full nodes and and to understanding what the privacy trade offs and risks are and stuff like that. And that'll always, I think, that'll always be more complicated, but it gets it does get way easier every day. Yeah. No, I really love the ethos, the mission, and the philosophy behind it because you know the user, as you said, you know comes first always. I think that's something you you tweeted about. Yeah, that's really important. Yeah. That's really important, and it, you know, it's 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 not really something you can lie about. Like people yeah. aren't idiots. Like if if, they, if the user doesn't come first, it becomes pretty apparent really quickly. And uh, we've had a lot of uh, missteps. Not mm -hmm. me personally, but in this com in this in this industry, we've had a lot of missteps where companies yeah. have clearly not acted in users' best interests. So sure. I, it's it's very, I'm very optimistic that you know we're seeing so many companies emerging that are that are that seem to be operating with their users you know in mind and and out of good faith and not you know not malicious and not, but they they want profit you know but that's good mm -hmm. greed's good. Mm -hmm. As long as they they're operating, you know, out of a good principle. Now I know I don't want to you know play this predictive game, but still there's you know um, rough estimates of how many users or hodlers there are worldwide, like 50, 100 million. We don't I think know. it's less. Yeah. Really? How, yeah. how much? I mean, how it's just like a gut. I think like thirty million or something oh like God. that is okay. what I think. Okay, good. You know. Um, do you see like a critical, like a critical number that would uh, that would that would initiate, trigger the the mass adoption, like really fast, a chain reaction? I mean, like, what's the population? The population is like seven and a half billion. Yeah, maybe even up to I don't know, so billion. like yeah, let's say seven billion. Yeah. Even if it if it's anywhere right now between twenty to one hundred million, it's still a drop in the bucket, right? It yeah. doesn't really matter yeah. what the what the actual number is because yeah. there's no one. It's yeah. so small. Look at these conferences when you come to these conferences. You know, we're right now we're in Riga. Um, it's a very small. It's still a very small industry. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of you know, recognize faces all over the place mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And and so yeah, I don't, I don't know what the critical mass is. Um, I, you know, I I think it will. You know, I like the term gradually and then suddenly, mm -hmm. and that's what's going to happen. It'll catch. Yeah. It it'll it'll be someday soon until it. It is. Yeah. So going back to the very first thing you said, because you know, to, to what I said is that Bitcoin is is as it is is it's just fine. It's just going just fine. Yeah. The the pace, the rate of speed, there's no coincidence. Sort of it, that maybe it's got to go with this slowliness of or whatever you know rate of speed. Do you think it, there... well, you know, the important thing here, the whole value prop is censorship resistance, right? Mm -hmm. So if 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 we go too quickly and then we kill the golden goose, like you got to you got to make sure that no matter what, uh, the the network is secure and you know without without state, if you can't prevent a single government from taking over the system, it's completely useless. Yeah. You might as well just use PayPal or something like that. So you got to be very conservative with development and realize that's the priority. And then we, we then we take it, then we take it from there. It's a feature. It's mm -hmm. not a bug. Wonderful. Well, Matt, thank you so much. Um, I would advise all my listeners really go to Tales of the Crypt, listen to the interviews. They're really deep. Sometimes I really have to re-listen to them you know, more than once because it's you know you got to digest all this knowledge and the comprehension. Is there anything like important, essential that people should do for themselves? Due diligence, you know, research, investigate, or whatever, or listen to, read. Yeah, I mean, do, to find you. Like, don't trust me. Don't trust anyone. You know, do your own research. Be High, you know, very, very skeptical, mm -hmm. um, and just stay humble and stack sets, you know? Wonderful, Wonderful. poetic. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Thank you. It's great fun to meet you. Talk to you soon. Thank you, bye. Welcome to the Total Connection Show. We're here at the Baltic Honey Badger Conference 2019 in Riga. We've got here Knut, Knut Swanholm, uh, the author of uh, Bitcoin Sovereignty Through Mathematics. One of those overdue books, I think. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Knut, um, you know, this is what I've been always emphasizing, especially for, you know, the entrance level of newbies, of, you know, people who have no notion, no, no you know, no, maybe not even the time to research, because it's so multifaceted, Bitcoin. Yeah. What do you think are the challenges, the obstacles, or what do you think is really urgent to, 
to make uh, you know people comprehend the people at least who are open minded and interested in you know getting into the Bitcoin space and you know start buying, hodling, and that's you know the simplicity of it. Uh, maybe I think people ought to think more about the uh, the current system and the flaws of the current system. And not many people comprehend money, and there's nothing in the public schools about it or anything. I I can't recall ever being taught about how money comes into existence or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, this book is meant to be thought-provoking and like uh, make people think. Sounds ambitious, but uh, uh, well, there we are. What was your approach? I mean, to the book, with what kind of question? Because it's always about the why question, you know, the why Bitcoin, or you know, what is it about? What's the essence? What's the purpose? What What is the ultimate, you know, bigger picture of Bitcoin? Do you, Do you think people really comprehend what it's what Bitcoin is really about? No, I, th I think the main misconception is that uh, people think that this this is a temporary thing, mm -hmm. and uh, they view it short term instead of long term. And I think this, I, I look at it at it as an uh, insurance policy for your grandchildren, so to speak. Isn't that what uh, Taleb also said, like a sort of insurance policy against the Orwellian something? Oh, he said that? Yeah, he said that, yeah. Yeah, the beautiful yeah. quote, I think in Safed oh, yeah. and Amu's book about... Oh. Yeah, yeah, Taleb, uh, Taleb is awesome. What's your feedback so far? I mean, what kind of feedback do you get from the readers or newbies who and, and start reading this? What, what do you, what, yeah, what? I haven't really... Uh, uh, this is sort of the first time that I'm mm. really trying to market it. And uh, well, the, all the feedback I received so far has been very good, so uh, I'm happy with it, and uh, I think I can be proud of it. And this is sort of why I took the next step and went here and tried to do something with it. So uh, I hope people like it. Yeah, great, great. So, um, uh, are you planning like to do uh, to publish, write, publish more books, like for? Uh, any kind of level of, of readers, like newbies, or or, um, or are you planning like to do more? I don't know seminars or presentations. Uh, no, I don't really have a plan in this, okay. and uh, it's just like uh, I felt I had to. You know, I'm a creative person, so I used to make music, and uh, I stopped being in a band, and I started writing instead, and. Uh, this year I promised myself to write a page a day, and I did until I felt it was finished. And now uh, I'm just happy for this journey and I'll see where it takes me. I have no idea, and, uh, but I'm just happy to be in this space and meet all the people I met on Twitter and so in real life. And it's, it's well, that's really good surreal. because because you come also from the creative um, background. I think it's a complementary part of it because uh, you, you think maybe differently or you have a different approach to how people process the information, the comprehension, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, might be right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's your bigger vision like for Bitcoin for the next years to come? What do you think is, how do you think people are going to mass adopt it? What do you think is a critical mass adoption? I, I think that's, that whole mindset is sort mm -hmm. of flawed because mm -hmm. I, I think this is a discovery rather than an invention, first and foremost, and that it can't be replicated in any shape or form because I really think Bitcoin had an immaculate conception, so to speak. And uh, this is something we should study and we should be humble in making predictions about it because no one really knows what different regulations and different uh, uh, how popular it will be in the future and so on. But I, I think the absolute scarcity part about it is the most in interesting thing. And uh, as long as we manage to keep it decentralized, uh, if the game theoretical uh, theories that it builds on are correct, which they seem to be, I mean, it could still fail, I don't see how, but if the game theoretical uh, theories are correct, then uh, I, I see no reason for the price to go anywhere but to the moon and beyond. <laughs> Just for the conclusion, do you think it's really something evolutionary, something so unique in our times to understand absolute scarcity, like hardest and scarcest money ever created in human history with a digital virtual you know, money? Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, we've never had that before and it's very hard for people to imagine what that does. But uh, uh, one thing I write about in the book is uh, Da Vinci paintings. The one, there are 13 left in the world, and one of the more, uh, of the ugliest ones of them sold for uh, like, <laughs> I don't remember the figure right now, but 
massive amount of millions of dollars. And uh, I think it's mainly because it's scarce yes. and it has a brand name. So I believe that all we need is a brand name and scarcity, a scarcity and then we're in for the beautiful set. Beautiful set. Any any other information or, or where they, where people uh, reader my, my listeners viewers can can find you or or any kind of uh, you know uh, info? Uh, all all the Bitcoin stuff I do uh, is on Twitter mainly. Mm -hmm. uh, What's your Twitter handle? Uh, Knut Svanom. At Knut Svanom. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and I write the articles on Medium mainly. But I as I said, I had no no plan for the future, so I might do something else. I like doing different things in life, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I have no idea really where <laughs> where this is going. Uh, well, yeah. Wish you all the luck and yeah, congratulations again to your book. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. All right. Are we on? We're rolling. We're all in. Alex, <laughs> good to see you, man. In person. Yeah, in person. <laughs> Live. <laughs> so Alex, um, we are the Honey Badger. Uh, uh, Baltic Conference um, 2019 in Riga, yep. and it's like really bombastic. I mean, the the substance, the the content, the concentration of, of, of knowledge, and and discussions, and you know, like it's got to really sink in everything. What's your impression after whatever? I mean, it's not over yet. We are, you know, we've got to go a long day go, uh, to go. But what would you say? See, this is this is what I love about your, you know, the, your, what you're doing, your presentations, you know, whatever that is in schools, colleges. It's about you know comprehension, the simplicity of your message, because we are not we are we are not there yet, you know, in that monetary evolutionary phase. Um, so it's about um, right now. It's just about a peace of mind, accumulating uh, satoshis, sats, and Bitcoin. What would you advise people? What do you think are the concerns of the average person out there? Um, since you are the co-founder or founder of, of Amber, what do you say? What would you advise or what, what would you suggest to people once they acu start accumulating satoshis? What shall they do? I mean, afterwards, mm. uh, in terms of security, privacy, um, you know, w w what's so urgent? You know, to, that people, you know, do do their own due diligence or should they just, you know, what should they do? Cool. Well, I, I think coming uh, coming to events like this for me um, just reinforces how incredibly early this whole thing is. Um, it really does. I mean, there's a, there's, what, what do we have here? 500 people, maybe 600 people? Like, it, it's, it's fuck all. Um, and, you know, we're all in a room somewhere in Riga, um, freezing our asses off, um, you know, with the cold. And it's just... <laughs> You know, when I compare it against like you know conferences that I've been to in the banking space, which are you know well established, huge, you know multi tens of millions of dollars spent on a conference and all that sort of stuff, um, you know, it, it just it just reinforces the idea that you know right now that the best game in town and what everybody should be doing is just getting some exposure to Bitcoin and just holding some right now because there is like what whilst we are still early like there is tangible real things happening here like the the, the cohort here are people who um believe in bitcoin who understand bitcoin relatively deeply um and not just the speakers but also all the participants here um or at least the majority of them i've met a couple shit coiners but um other than that like p people th this is the stubborn minority right here and and, and we're not we're not here because it's some fucking Ethereum game where, you know, we're dressed up in costumes and we're playing games with each other. We're, we're here because, you know, we've, we've understood the first principles uh, behind a sound, a sounder money or a harder money and all of those things. So there, there's real substance, but it's early as hell. And, you know, th there's a lot of talk like, you know, here at the event where we're talking about, uh, privacy and running your own node and all, all of these other things um which are all fucking great um but for the average person out there the average retail person that they're not going to know about any of that stuff so you know there's probably two arguments there is you know one argument is number one let's just get some skin in the game first let's let's get them to hold some bitcoin because you're not going to get them to think about privacy and sovereignty and all of those sorts of things from the beginning right um when people um come from that angle 
you know, they're more primed to jump straight into, you know, the, the deep end of Bitcoin already. But for most people, they're, they're not primed. You know, the, the, the hook that we've got to bring them in on is, you know, the idea of a better future through, um, you know, being more financially free. Um, and you can be more financially free by looking at uh, buying some of this asset that is outperforming every, everything else. And I think that's that first hook. And that's at least what we're trying to do. And then the, the question is, once you've got them in, then which path do you guide them down? And and that's where, like, you know, I want to have a chat with Rodolfo from Cold Card to be able to, you know, provide our users with, hey, you know, you're, you're using Amber to stack sets, mm -hmm. but now, you know, you've you've stacked some sats yeah. you know you've got some bitcoin now H how do you become sovereign um and how do you you know like i, I don't with, really care to use of use yeah you correct know, correct that, correct that's correct. the ultimate challenge well, well, it, well it is and, and again i think we spoke about this a couple of weeks ago is um just the, the ease of use is just going to come um we, we'll know the ease of use is happening as the price appreciates because the easier it gets, the more capital people are going to put into it. The more capital pe people put into it, the, um, the, the higher the price. The higher the price, the more the economic incentive for others to get involved is. The more people that get involved, the easier the use will become. And, and it's this sort of self-reinforcing loop. Like ev everywhere you look in Bitcoin, you've got these um, positive feedback loops. You know, the, these virtuous cycles that just feed on themselves and make the thing stronger. It's incredible. So... Yeah, to, to, to sum all of that up, we're early, but there's real shit going on here. There's people, you know, who, you know, whether you call them the stubborn minority, where you call them the insiders, whatever you want to define us as, um, you know, we're, we're the, <laughs> we're like the, that uh, community that Steve Jobs and Bill Gates were a part of in the 70s, you know, the, the home, what was it called? The, um, the homebrew computer club, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's what we're doing here, you know, just... Uh, a little bit more cypherpunky, a little bit more, you know, th this is our generation's version. And, and it's, it's an incredible thing. Has anything become more clear to you since, you know, since we, uh, we are, you know, this, on this conference, like in terms of, you know, what we need to work on individually, collectively, or uh, uh, what, like, have, are there any points, like, become to you more obvious or more, you know, more c concernful, you know, like... Uh, in terms of whatever uh, that is, like mis misconceptions uh, people might have, a communication? No, not really. I, I think, um, if anything, this has just reinforced uh, how early we are again. Like, okay. the, f for me, that's it. Like, because I, I think, despite this being one of the better Bitcoin conferences, it, it is still small, it is still fringe. It, mm -hmm. it's, it still has that fringe element about it. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you're not going to see any, um, you know, and and although like I, I love the fringe aspect like you know that this w you can tell we're nowhere near mainstream no, definitely. nowhere near no. nowhere fucking near um and you know the, depending on which uh, where you stand that's that's a good and a bad thing right it's it's a good thing because it's just part of the cycle and we're still early and it allows us to accumulate as much as possible and, and that's like t to be honest i don't mind if um we don't see another bull market for a couple of years to be honest because mm -hmm. that's going to just i mean i'm speaking selfishly here but it's going to allow me to accumulate more bitcoin which is what i want um i, I don't mind that because it i like i mean it's an inevitability mm -hmm. and and the more i like, you know, in these circles, you know, and the stuff we talk about at events like this, it's not about, uh, you know, is Bitcoin going to become the thing? It's it's the question of when. Exactly. Um, and do you think things are going to, but still, do you think things could happen out of, I mean, out of, there is no coincidence, there is a, there's a pace, you know, a rate of speed that's going on, and it's good that it's taking this while, you know, because even Matt O'Dell said, Bitcoin as it is, it's, it's just fine. It takes it some otherwise maybe it would sort of you know uh maybe sacrifice the golden goose or something like that he said so what if you know what if things like uh you know fall in place like in synchronicity like recession coming maybe end of december there's experts talking i'm not saying that there's an expert saying that in europe coming you know are we prepared for like like people flocking to <laughs> bitcoin as safe haven besides gold or whatever yeah look murad yesterday was talking about you know the 
the the Google so he showed the chart of the Google searches. Mm-hmm. Did you see that? Where yeah. you know more people are trying to uh, you know uh, equate Bitcoin as a safe haven. But you know I agree with him, and I've said this before on a couple of podcasts. I don't think Bitcoin's a safe haven yet. I think it's still too speculative. Okay. But by definition, it's a safe haven. But um, by collective uh, uh, by collective perception, it's mm-hmm. not a safe haven. Um, you know may, maybe in our community, and but again we're the fringe. No, no one gives a fuck about the fringe um, w- when you think about the, um, the the global macro scene. Like, mm-hmm. when people are shitting their pants and things are crashing, they're, they're going to go to the fucking US dollar. It's as simple as that. It's still too early for that. Right. So I, I don't see any of that um, changing. You know, but hey, I could be wrong. I don't know. That, you know, should should there be a, a, a calamity um, from a financial macro um, standpoint? Maybe that will drive capital to Bitcoin. I have no fucking idea. But I, I guess the important anecdote that I got from that is that the, the meme of yeah. Bitcoin as a safe haven is starting to like take hold. Okay. And, and, and that meme is going to become self-fulfilling, right? Mm-hmm. J- just like the, the store of value meme before that, you know, the, the meme of funny internet money. Like all, like one, one of the most incredible things about this space is that, you know, we, we sort of bring memes to life mm-hmm. over time. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it's so... It's so um, apt and it's so uh, it's so fitting for an internet money for you know memes to be the driver of um, you know people's understanding of what it is mm-hmm. that um, yeah like it's it's just it's, it's just perfect in that sense so, so I don't know you know whether things that are happening you know geopolitically and you know, macroeconomically are going to, to help accelerate this they may or may not I think Pierre said something really interesting today where he said, that the pace of technological advancement is probably outpaced yeah. um, adoption, yeah. which is an interesting thing mm-hmm. because you know you look at we can still send a Bitcoin transaction for a sat per byte, mm-hmm. and that's really fucking cheap. So you know the blocks are still fundamentally empty. The, you know Bitcoin is still cheap, and I, and I think all that represents is literally an opportunity for all of us. That that it, uh, it represents an opportunity for all of us who are in the space, so the insiders, number one, but number two, those who are on the board on the sidelines. Who are thinking the ones who are um, who are not lazy the ones who are willing to put in some effort to understand a little bit more and dig beneath the surface um, they're the ones who are going to have the opportunity to um, to front run the rest of the world yeah. and and I think that's perfectly fair like the, the, those who should be rewarded are those who put the effort in the time in yeah. and the energy in to figure it out Exactly. And, and that's what we're all fucking doing here. I mean, I flew halfway around the world, 36 hour flight just to get masked over here. Why? Because, you know, I wanted to like meet people, yeah. you know, I got a copy of this from Jimmy. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, th- 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 this is what we're, we're fucking doing this from the inside, man. And, yeah. um, and yeah, so I, th- I think it's all, um, th- the more I'm in this, the more I realize that, um, the progression and all of these sorts of things, um, like are just happening as they need to um, and the economic incentives are just driving um, exactly. what we you know each each participant needs to um, mm-hmm. you know so do the, the principle of, of Bitcoin again just for the conclusion is uh, absolute scarcity do you want to like comment on you know the coming happening the stock to flow ratio that you know the scarcity is like becoming you know scarcer and scarcer and scarcer do you think this is something that could like overtake this whole process i mean somehow or do you think it just uh it's not going to have much effect it will but but it, it's i don't think like i don't think the market prices things in well so what i think will happen is after the um halving mm-hmm. is that as capital comes in to the on onto the network mm-hmm. the, the, there'll be just less bitcoin out there mm-hmm. um and it'll like if the same amount of capital comes in and there's less Bitcoin out there, um, that's going to fundamentally put upward pressure on the price. Well, cool. Yes, it's simple. So, um, so, so I think that so at that point in time, I think what will happen is the market will get spooked and people think, oh, this thing's running away. As soon as we break the, 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 the previous top, the, the world's going to lose their mind. Maybe not as soon as we break the previous top, maybe like, you know, if we hit 30, 40 grand US. The rest of the world will fucking lose their mind, and then we'll see the next um, the next bull run. But mm-hmm. we will have all had an opportunity to, you know, quoting Matt O'Dell, to stack as many sats as possible, to buy as much Bitcoin as possible. Like th- th- this is like the fucking opportunity now. So what we need to be doing is relishing in the moment and taking full advantage yeah. of every single moment right now. Um, Which you do still with your educational work, and that's Correct. what I was going to ask. Yeah, you know, w- do you want to talk about the roadmap of? Uh, 
amber, like, you know, also educational wise, like as a complimentary? I mean, do, do you want to talk about comment? Well, I mean, look, I, I'm just going to keep getting out there and talking. So I'm, I'm speaking to the guys from Value of Bitcoin Conference. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully I can come and talk to that talk um, at that next year. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to do another edition of the Bitcoin Times. Um, wow. Uh, you know, edition number two, um, we're probably also going to set the Bitcoin Times up for print. I'm writing a short book called The Guide to Investing in Bitcoin. So it's going to sort of take people through a, um, you know, a journey of, you know, why money is important, what it is, you know, why Bitcoin's the better money, the total addressable this market and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so if, if I can put that together, um, you know, we're going to do like a short copy and a longer form copy. The short copy we're going to sort of distribute around Australia as a, um, as a tool for people to, um, you know, to, to, to basically use that initial hook, right? Yeah. It, the, the, this is an investment opportunity. Get people hooked in and then really just bring them along the journey. So, um, I mean, th that's like when I look at what our edge is as a business in this space is, um, is the fact that, you know, I'm, me and the team are willing to be balls deep in Bitcoin mm -hmm. and go out there and actually produce content, teach people and build a community and a cohort of people yeah. who, um, who we've you know, genuinely fucking helped them in a significant way in their lives. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I, I still like, w w one of the things that excites me is like, when we first launched the, the, the beta of the product, like the really, really early, I would even call it an alpha product. We had about, you know, 50 or 100 users that were part of that. And some of those users, and, and that was literally when Bitcoin was three grand. Yeah, and those users were, were buying Bitcoin back then. Mm -hmm. And and they all fucking love us right now. See? They love us right yeah. now. They're like, fucking Anvil yeah. is the best decision I ever made. Blah, blah, blah. They're up three, four, five hundred percent, whatever they are. Exactly. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's and, and, and they're out there then, you know, shilling people to say, look, download Amber. I got in at this point in time and blah, blah, blah. So I, I can't wait to see, you know, the next couple thousand users and the next 10, 15, 20, 100,000 users who over the next three, four, five years mm -hmm. are going to turn around and say, this was the best decision I made in my fucking life. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think that is, um, that, that's a powerful place to come from. Yeah. So in the name of my listeners and viewers, thank you so much. <laughs> Every time I, you know, I really enjoy it and learn so much, man. Thank you so much. Bye. Pleasure, man. Peace. Bye. Welcome to the Total Connect show. We are at the Baltic Honey Badger Conference 2019 Riga. I got this legendary Giacomo Zucco. Thank you so much for taking your time. Thank you, it's an honor. Yeah, listen Giacomo, you, have, you did a really, I mean, mind-blowing presentation. I know the cynicism, the sarcasm is part of it, but there's a substance, there's a content you want to deliver. So, you know what I love about you? I mean, you, you really articulate, you express things that what Bitcoin is about. It's about freedom. And that's the one essence I really want, want you to talk about. Because, I mean, I know the, the title of the, your presentation today was the shitcoin apology. Ap apology, apology yeah. Yeah. Can, you, can you go a little bit into detail or um, what, what's, the, what's the bigger vision behind it? And, uh, because I do, I do seriously think that it was really credible. You, you're really appreciative of the shitcoiner because it somehow serves the purpose of Bitcoin, directly or indirectly. You want to comment on that? It's yours. It's yeah. Yours. Thank you so much. In a way, there is like uh, always a balance that we have to keep uh, because uh, Bitcoin is freedom. So Bitcoin is about the competition in the sector of money. Competition means that we cannot take anything for granted. We cannot stay with the state monopoly. And so uh, we start from a situation of uh, something uh, dictated top down and we move the pendulum to another extreme, which can be an extreme of confusion, of uh, entropy, of, uh, uh, of un uh, lack of coordination. So on one side there is like slavery, on the other side there is chaos. Chaos is not slavery, but it's not good as well. So Bitcoin, as many other kind of free, open the market standards, is an attempt to let everybody free to choose what they want, but still try to find a coordination, to find a shelling point, to find standards. Basically, right now we are talking in English. Uh, English is, even if I can, I can maybe misguide you with my perfect Oxfordian accent, English is actually not my first language. I know this may surprise your viewer, but we're talking in English. 
English. Why? Because that's a standard. We didn't. We are not forced to talk in English. It's not a top-down decision, but it's like a, conver a free convergence by the market that wants to find the common denominator. Uh, if anything, uh, imposition, violent imposition, were actually what is keeping national languages alive because many nation, many nations decided to destroy local dialects and to impose languages, destroying either the local identities and the the global. Uh, uh, attempt to find standards, uh, which human beings always trying to find. So, in a way, uh, fiat dollar is violent monopoly. Uh, the shitcoin uh, world of fantasy is like chaos because it's a world in which nobody even tries to find a standard, something rational, something that can work at, at mass, at scale. And Bitcoin maximalism is actually, uh, is, uh, for, by shitcoiners, it's, it's perceived as is some kind of pres prescriptive standard. It's, uh, it's not. It's a de facto, uh, it's a descriptive standard of something that actually emerges. So the last year I tried to make this point, uh, exaggerating ironically the meaningless of uh, Bitcoin maximalists. So I did this like uh, blood uh, font presentation about Bitcoin maximalism, trying to, uh, to be a self parody of Bitcoin maximalists uh, because uh, some shit corner described Bitcoin maximalism as something mean, toxic, aggressive. So I, I self parodied that. And this year I went to the other, uh, other, other way, of course, the, the, the content is still the same. The content is still that everybody should be free to do whatever they want, but the fact that you are free to do something doesn't mean that it will work in real life at scale. Uh, so you should be free to experiment, but we should be all free to act actually try to uh, prioritize experiments uh, in, in a way that makes sense to us based on our uh, scientific or, or ethical or other kind of convictions. So uh, shit coiners are fine. They are not the final enemy of Bitcoin. The final enemy of Bitcoin is central banking and uh, and and, mean, and financial surveillance. So uh, shit coiners, in a way, have been uh, uh, altcoins in general have been targeted by Bitcoiners sometimes because they have been and they are a distraction, uh, a, um, uh, a possible distraction that can actually uh, ruin some kind of. Uh, it can actually distract money, time, reputation of people that could be available. So let's imagine that you are in a war. You are in an actual, actual war with an enemy. And uh, some of you is organizing a real military action. And some of you uh, think that since the, they want to defeat the enemy with the magic uh, rain dance, they are going to rain dance during your military action. You don't attack your, your friends because they are your friends. You attack the enemy. But still, you may be a little bit annoyed by the fact that something completely naive and something completely uh, impossible to realize is distracting uh, resources, time, money, and reputation. Plus, of course, some of these people, some of people in the altcoin fields, they are really convinced they are doing something sustainable and they, are, they aren't. Some of them are scientifically scamming people, taking advantage of this good ability. Because as I said before, there is a pendulum, right? When I first met Bitcoin, I was skeptical. And I think that the, the first normal uh, default position you should have ab about extraordinary claims is skepticism. If some, something is an extraordinary claim, be skeptical and demand uh, extraordinary evidences. So I was skeptical. When I understood that Bitcoin was real, I became immediately basically gullible. Uh, I, was, I was believing in anything for a while, but like Bitcoin destroyed my skepticism. And then I actually made an effort to recover uh, my skepticism to a position of some kind of equilibrium. And that's uh, the, the situation in which we all are. And even my presentation tried to replicate that uh, f from mean, evil, uh, toxic maximalist to uh, gentle, nice, uh, uh, open-minded shit corner like myself today. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Let me let me go a little bit. Let's zoom a little bit out. What do you think are the the essential um, misconceptions, or, or is there a lack of ethos or foresightedness? A lack of foresight? Lack of pretty? You know, like uh, I'm like. If just individuals with it, then the shit coinery or wherever they are in no coinery, do you think they, people just don't grasp the dimension, the potentials of what is possible with Bitcoin? Like if we talk about Austrian economics, Hoppe talked about the process of civilization, or you know Safed and Amus uh, comparing the gold standard and the, you know the La Belle Epoque. 
Um, do you think we are somehow so much indoctrinated, brainwashed, that we don't get the bigger picture what is possible with the structure, foundation, architecture of Bitcoin? What kind of civilization would be possible? I'm just trying to zoom out a little bit and, you know, that why Bitcoin? Yeah, I, I do think that uh, you mentioned Saifedian's presentation. Much of Saifedian's book and research is based on the concept of the, the very important concept in Australian economics about time preference. So time and time preference. We are a civilization that lives in a, a very high time preference. We think about the present. So high preference is how much you prefer your pre present gain over your future gain. And we, even if we, gone, if we don't go too far, but we think about our grandparents, you, we can see a different civilization based on the notion of saving, waiting, building a reputation, building knowledge, studying, building an enterprise, building something for the future. Is a typical, you know, the the the, the ant and the, uh, the, the the fairy tale, right? You, you want to to store, save, be cautious, be mindful of the future, and to profit in the future. Well, we are moving more and more, and probably we are the peak of a civilization based on not even just consumption, but debt and consumption. So we don't, uh, our grandfather, to, 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 to live in a house, our grandfather will most likely working, saving, buying, or even building, and then living debt-free. We are mostly working, spending everything, uh, getting into debt to get even more, and buying a house with that, that will be, is completely unsustainable. So this kind of, uh, yeah, the interesting part of the analysis of Saifedian is that this kind of dynamic is related to money, very much related to money, in, 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 a, in two different, two ways basically, in a bi-directional way, because the way that central banks manage money today incentivize and increase uh, time preference in the population and high time preference is also something that uh, in, in turn increases uh, a, a, a way weird and, and, and unhealthy vision of money as something that should be uh, debt and uh, never stored, always spent. It's, it's, it's very interesting that people blame capitalism uh, for something like consumerism. So the fact that everybody is consuming, polluting, destroying the environment, over-consuming, over debt. People blame that to capitalism. But that's the very negation of capitalism. People associate that with capitalism because it's something that is going very strong in the Western world, uh, led by the US. So since that's the capitalist world, so consumerism must be capitalism. But that's the, it's the other way around. Capitalism is actually the, 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 the notion, the art of saving and investing to have something more later. Exactly. Which well, is exactly the opposite of Keynesianism. Isn't the opposite, yeah. By the way, he, was, he didn't even have a notion of capital theory. Precisely. It, it was not even a real economist. And the, 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 what people call uh, calls, uh, right now capitalism is actually uh, monetary socialism uh, as, as identified by Keynes. So U.S. is not capitalism. It's monetary socialism. And Bitcoin is something that fixes that. <laughs> Bitcoin solves that. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, you can see that, in a way, this kind of cultural distortion in the altcoin and shitcoin fields as well. Uh, many shitcoiners, they actually cannot be uh, low time preference. When Satoshi is creating Bitcoin, he's creating something, for example, without getting any money, he's not doing an ICO. He's doing something that is worth nothing. He's not asking for money. First, he codes. So first Satoshi finishes a working code. Then he writes an academic white papers. Then he starts to open up to the community. Then he starts mining, but without any advantage. He's also giving, he's using the, the, the time, the, 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 the London Times um, page in order to prove that he had, hasn't any advantage advantage. So uh, he's not want, he doesn't want a money grab. He doesn't want a quick buck. He wants to build something that maybe if Satoshi is still around, if he has private keys of the first mining Bitcoin, maybe now he could be multi-billionaire. But now, not then. While the typical ICO shitcoin is some guys that say, I have an idea. I don't want to code it. I don't want to write about it. I just want your money. Give me millions. Then I buy my Lambos and then maybe I start to work on the protocol. And that sadly doesn't work because that's not how human nature works. And the same goes for uh, security and features. Like Bitcoin is not about, uh, there is a new new tech, unproven, science fiction-like, I want it now. But first we, went to, we want to experiment, we want to try, we want to test. So the evolution of Bitcoin development is what works in the long 
run, what is safe, what is experimented, what is battle tested. While shitcoins mostly are, there is a new shiny thing, maybe developed by, maybe created by the Bitcoin developers. Bitcoin developers are too boring to use it now, so we want it immediately because we want the shiny, over-evolving things. We create something which is usually unsecure and uh, and and fast evolving, which is very bad for money. You want fast evolution at very upper layer of the economy, like services and uh, and, and products. You don't want you know, so society basically is, is, is done in layer. At the very bottom layer, you have infrastructures, languages, protocols, something that you need to be. Uh, convergent so the more similar it is like English right now mm -hmm. the better because we can communicate and stable the less it changes the better like mm -hmm. internet must be stable a universal mm -hmm. uh, on top you, you get uh, some protocols that can have more variance and more evolution and then at the very top you have uh, like my new service it must be it must evolve very rapidly and it must be different so to, to make an example if you if you play a Facebook game one of the apps on top of Facebook like Candy Crusher game uh, you expect to have many many different games competing and a fast evolution of gaming because you want new game Facebook it's less fast to evolve is lower to evolve and you don't need seven Facebook you need one maybe two maybe three uh, below that there is the web the World Wide Web, a HTTP protocol. That's even slower to evolve and there are li little l less uh, alternative. Under that there is TCP, which is even harder to change, uh, harder to compete with. And then there is IP, which is absolutely uh, not changing since the 80s and will be probably not change for a while, even th if there are better alternatives, but the point is stability. Bitcoin is low in this kind of uh, uh, hierarchy of, uh, of, uh, of layers. So Bitcoin must stay consistent, reliable, mm -hmm. and convergent and universal. Mm -hmm. Not, co not inside, inside compet competitive inside. It must be competitive outside, but convergent inside. So uh, yeah, you you identified the the point of time preference, which is actually also what distinguishes shitcoins by uh, from Bitcoin. <laughs> Love you, wisdom. <laughs> sure, come on. So um, see. Um, I think you always uh, always see, you know, you go to countries like Venezuela, Turkey, Iran, Argentina, you know, they got, they, they feel the pain. And this is what I'm saying, could this be like the crucial challenge, the art of challenge, like making people understand, even though they don't like people, I'm, I'm, I mean, live in Austria, you know, in Europe or other Western countries, people don't feel the pain. They don't feel the existential, they don't see, they don't feel it. So why should they care about Bitcoin? Now, if things fall in place in synchronicity, simultaneous or whatever, like converging, you know, like like everything fall in place, geopolitical, macroeconomic, do you see things like uh, triggering a chain reaction of, you know, perception, changing of perception, and then people are waking up like, oh, now I get it, you know? The yeah. rate of speed, you know, like... Yeah, again, massive. it's very difficult to learn. Uh, so again, it's about time preference. Uh, y you don't care about the future problem. Mm -hmm. You mostly, society now, especially in the Western countries, they only care about present problems. So it's difficult to, to make people change their habits because of something that is realistic, but future. So uh, in, in Argentina or Venezuela, you have people with problems now, even just in China to export capital or whatever. You, need pe you have people with problems now in in austria you, if you have a credit card and the euro seems stable enough of maybe i mean the dollar is not stable right. now they say stable coin for for dollar coins i mean not stable it lost, it, it have lost 90, 98% of uh, purchasing power i mean it's that's not stability but it's uh, short term stable it's long term unstable but short term stable so in the short run you don't have a problem uh, the point is that uh, you realize that you have a problem when it's uh, uh, arguably too late, like people in Cyprus, when they realize they couldn't access uh, ATM's machine anymore, yeah, yeah. so Berlin in Cyprus or the, the, the second crisis in Greece, uh, one day you, you wake up and you see that you cannot access the money from your bank account, it's gone. Yeah, or it's not gone, but you cannot access it for weeks. And you have to buy medicines, and there is no government that you can write to. There's no, you have to buy medicines, you don't have your money. 
that's something that uh, people could, thought it could just happen in subtropical, uh, strange uh, dictatorships. It happened in Europe, in, maybe in the periphery of Europe, but that's not something that cannot happen. And so another perspective problem, looking at the short run, is that we think that something like that cannot happen in France, in Italy, in Austria, or in the United States of America. But that did happen. That uh, Stuff like that did happen at the heart of Europe uh, with Germany, the Republic of Weimar. Is that, I mean, hyperinflation is a tale from Zimbabwe, sure. We can make fun of Zimbabwe uh, because it's so far and yeah. so different. But mm -hmm. the heart of Europe had an hyperinflation crisis just uh, when our grandpa grandparents were, were alive. So not like in the, in the history of... In the, in, uh, in the history of few generations before us. And that can basically happen again. And there are very few scenarios in which that doesn't happen again. So the point is how to make people ready before they need it. Because when they need it, it will be arguably too late. I mean, they can adapt, but they will suffer a lot. They will learn through sufferance. It's better to learn through, uh, through, mm, I mean, through knowledge than to learn through sufferance. But it's very difficult. Uh, luckily, Bitcoin has some tricks. Like uh, Bitcoin is a survival mechanism and uh, it's a, like an anti-system uh, uh, bet disguised as a get-rich-quick scheme. So some investor may actually start to, to use Bitcoin because uh, they, are, they want to make money out of its adoption outside the privileged uh, West. But then they may be ready or more ready when, when actually something bad happened in the West. So, uh, or even the technology, you know, the meme, I'm here for the technology. Maybe some guy really doesn't understand monetary history and policies, but they want to experiment with Bitcoin because it's cool. Mm -hmm. That's not a good approach, but maybe they're saving themselves because of that approach. I mean, there, is, there, there could be people that may be saved by monetary apocalypse because they wanted to buy marijuana on the web. That would be very ironic. <laughs> okay. okay, last question. Um, uh, do, you see, do you see in the foreseeable future I know it, I think it takes time, maturity, you know, it's a process. When we talk about like Adam Beck, you know, all these people like uh, Elena or you, you, you guys are all working like super committed, dedicated. Do you see like we're going to have like a super compact package? We're going to give like to our pictures or real grandparents. It's like here's your package. You don't, you're totally independent even of the internet and electricity if everything fails. You got your GoTenna, local mesh network, everything is plug and play. Do you see that coming? That would, isn't that, wouldn't that be like a, the ultimate dream, the ultimate vision of freedom? It will be. Uh, we, we work to approximate that vision as much as possible. That vision, I don't think it will never realistically be, be accomplished in a full way. Because you always have an inherent trade-off, and the trade-off is basically between convenience and fragility. Mm -hmm. Things that are convenient, that are easy, usually are more fragile. And things that are hard and resistant, they are less convenient. So, for example, let's uh, think about, uh, let, let's exclude for now electricity and everything. Just think about a, a Bitcoin node. If you buy your hardware from uh, some kind of commodity store and you install uh, and you download source code, uh, you verify the signature and then you deterministically build off, no, nobody will do that. But if you do that, the chance to attack you are very, very low. If you just buy some kind of uh, Bitcoin branded stuff, and you buy it and you get it delivered from mail and you plug it, then that's easy. So there may be more people doing that, which is better for the network, but individually, uh, everybody's easier to attack, to target and to attack. Think about uh, 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 how easy it will be for now for a nation state to, to target a, a, a Bitcoin hardware wallet company yeah. to compromise it because it's while it will be more difficult to actually uh, attack a normal computer. But the normal computer is a is a mess of attack surface, while the hardware wallet is very tiny, so you can try to review it and to control it. So it's always trade-offs. It's very difficult to uh, have a cake and eat it too. Uh, usually you have to choose, and, and choosing is never the best solution. So uh, I think we can mitigate the problem, but never fully solve it. If you want real independence, you have to work for it, and you have to learn for it, you have to suffer for it. And so even if you are the grandmother, uh, but I mean, when, when stuff is important, yeah, but when things are important enough, 
you learn. Like uh, I, I, somebody, there's people telling me uh, people will never learn to do comma line mm -hmm. signature verification. Mm -hmm. That just people is not alphabetized enough to do that. But people were not going to read or write for for centuries. It was impossible to imagine everybody, including your grandmother, reading a legal contract before signing. So these people were were actually forced to actually ask to some kind of uh, some kind of wizard uh, reading for them, writing for them, and signing with an X. And now. In, at least in our privileged world, even the grandmother, maybe they cannot really understand the legal terms, they still need the lawyers, but they can read contracts and write contracts sometimes or, or correct contracts. This is incredible. People were able to actually check uh, their medical records. If the doctor is wrong, they can try to do independent research, ask for other opinions. So people can have independence because they learn. Uh, getting independence just as a plug and play product that you, that you, uh, that you plug in your wall is not going to happen. Uh, we can mitigate things. We can try to uh, yeah, find them, you know, to make it, and yeah. Uh, like Intuitive. grandmothers will have to learn more and developers will have to learn how to be more friendly. And I think that uh, the, the thing will be a double, a double um, effort to meet middle, middle ground. Uh, right now, nerds in Bitcoin, they want to make something safe. They don't care yet for, for, because it's not that they don't care because they are evil. They don't care because they don't understand it. For them, uh, writing comma line stuff is natural. So they don't even understand what it means. Or for them to have a, to have a computer at home is natural. Yeah. So they do peer-to-peer -peer software that needs a node. Mm -hmm. But for a guy who is maybe is very smart business guy working in technology, mm -hmm. but with uh, using the cell phone plus cloud paradigm since 10 years, this guy doesn't even have a, 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 a server running. He doesn't even know what the server is anymore. But it's not stupid or, 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 or uh, technically uh, Un, uh, impossible to, to educate. Mm -hmm. So there will be a double effort, but this effort, I mean, many people right now think that this effort will be unital, uh, un, uh, unilateral uh, from the developer. Mm -hmm. It will be, it will be uh, from two sides. Users will have to become way and way more uh, evoluted and way more sophisticated. And that happens when there is need. Uh, again, People were, use, uh, were able to fix a, a car if the car breaks in the road. Now, not anymore because everything is electronic. But back then, uh, our grandfathers may fix a car. Uh, is that a specialized knowledge? Sure. Uh, is going everybody to become a specialized mechanic? No. But just enough, just, just what you need to be sure that the mechanic is not, uh, is not messing around with you, at least. All right. Well... Anyway, uh, Giacomo, you know, I don't want to sound kitsch, but really, uh, thank you for all your work. You guys, I mean, a still super small minority of, you know, people of, you know, dedicated technologies, programmers, coders, developers, UX, UI designers, you know, Bitcoiners, Bitcoin maximalists, Bitcoin realists. It's, it's really, I think, we sh maybe a lot of people take it for granted, but, but really thank you for all your work, ethos, and because if it weren't up to you guys, we wouldn't evolve. I mean, we're talking about like civil you know, human, human civilization that is evolving, you know, otherwise uh, we're, just, we're just probably just changing symptoms. So I think we need to, it's about like, you know, transforming or processing the roots of this system, right, of this civilization. So anyway, thank you so much for your dedication and commitment and hope to, you know, uh, yeah, uh, get in touch with you again. Thank you so much. It will be my pleasure. I want to, I mean, not, not to sound uh, overly humble, but I think that the individual contribution is less and less important. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, as in any movement or system, I mean, without Satoshi Nakamoto, we will be in big trouble. Exactly. Uh, right now, without me, probably, the, the other will fill the place. So the uh, in individual contribution is getting still important. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, still, it's not that the market will fix it. You are the market. You have to fix it. So we still have to take uh, this stuff in our hands and to, and to make it work. Mm -hmm. But... Fortunately, nobody of us is irreplaceable anymore. Otherwise, we would be a target. So that's good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Yeah, there we are. Welcome to the Total Connector Show. Um, Thank you. Peter, uh, it's great meeting you. Can you, can you introduce yourself a little bit? You are the co-founder of uh, Bottle. Yes. And um, I had a great time with you, by the way, since last uh, evening, because we have so much co in common, you know, from... Uh, starting with the ethos and you know, a philosophy and, and, and mission and you know the whole essence of Bitcoin um, yeah you want to tell a little bit 
the audience a little bit about yourself? Sure. So, thank you so much. So, I, I first, I think for me, Bitcoin has been a journey in the sense that maybe for half of my life I've been looking into alternative information. I started to question certain things, the financial system. I did a philosophy degree, so I enjoy analyzing and discussing various concepts and for me bi arriving at the point where I'm working full-time with Bitcoin and we've co-founded a, a brand and a company just makes total sense in the sense that for me Bitcoin is a, is a, is a lifestyle and it's what we're doing is putting this technology into the hands of more people that's the whole objective is to make it simple to put any complexity to hide that under the hood and that's our objective. I've been using Bitcoin for a few years now. I still, when I have to copy and paste a wallet address, I still get nervous. I still worry about making an error. I still think to myself, how, are, how is the everyday person going to interact with this technology? Are they not going to be concerned? This is the idea of being completely responsible for your own funds, being your own bank is a great ideal, but I think that in the short term, we're in 2019, the, the second half of 2019. I don't think that the average person who's never interacted with Bitcoin at this point is ready to take full responsibility for their funds, which is why we've decided to be custodial. And we're concentrating on the, on the user experience. We're trying to make it intuitive, incredibly simple, a pleasure to use and the point is to make it a pleasure and to make sure that the average person can understand it and wants to interact with this technology. So that, that's the stage we're at at the moment. Yeah, um, well, as I said, you know, as we talked before, um, I really loved the, uh, you know, what Matt O'Dell, uh, one of your new team, team members said on, on Twitter that, hey, uh, you know, the user comes first always. And it's, it's, yes. it's, it's not easy to be honest with you. I mean, the way I see it, it's not easy, I think, to empathize, especially from perspective of the yes. developers, uh, coders, programmers, whatever, all these, you know, entrepreneurs, it's like putting yourself into the shoes of a really average, non inexperienced, non-technical uh, user who on top of that doesn't even know why, he's, why he should be doing this. Yeah. He just wants to do, you know, he just wants to maybe get get his or, his or her skin in the game. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so what's the bigger picture? What's, is there a bigger vision to it? Or what, what's your roadmap? Uh, if you want to, if you, if you, you know, feel, feel free to disclose it. I mean, yeah, sure. So we're integrating layer one, which means that people can, with our, our primary market at this stage is Bitcoin users. So people who are already interacting with this technology and already holding Bitcoin. So it makes sense to have a layer one integration so that people can transfer their Bitcoin into the bottle, bottle pay wallet in a, in a very seamless way. And we've got the social linking technology, which enables us to create a lightning wallet attached to a particular social account. And the whole concept of this is to put the technology into a familiar context for people and people are already using social media, people are already using chat apps such as Telegram. So the point of it all is, is to make it seamless and to make it familiar for people. So we have a number of announcements coming up. We're announcing a seed funding round that we're closing in the very near future. We have the mobile app in development, which is due in time for our Berlin conference, the lightning conference in Berlin in, in mid October. And we have developer tools that we're creating that will enable the community to build on our tech stack and create beautiful pro we can't even imagine what that would evolve into and that's one of the beauties of this technology is that it's completely unpredictable it's not completely unpredictable but we're we're happy to let it evolve on its own and we're happy to just guide the process and ha let it have a life of its own without trying to control it too closely so that's the overall objective is the hyper Bitcoinization that people talk about and the mass adoption that can only come with seamless user experience and it can only come with making the, the whole technology a pleasure to interact with. with at the moment. We need to be aware that there's a lot of a perception of this asset class as being risky. People are concerned about hacks. People heard about scams. People sometimes conflate Bitcoin with crypto and so we're trying we're making it clear that we're a bitcoin company we're building on lightning which is a very user-friendly instant low fee way of transferring bitcoin 
trying to communicate in value from one user to another and plus the fact that we're currently using social media and eventually phone numbers as well to make it possible to send Bitcoin to anyone. Even if they don't currently hold Bitcoin or they've never heard of Bitcoin, we want to make it possible to send Bitcoin to those users. This is great. Um, what about the educational uh, you know, um, part of it? Uh, uh, do you guys plan like to you know, give people uh, the bigger picture or, you know, the, the, the question of why Bitcoin, you know, the essence of money, what is good money, what is hard money, uh, uh, all the, you know, everything is going on, the fears, the paranoia, the panic mode, mm -hmm. uh, geopolitical, macroeconomically, inflation, hype of recession coming. Uh, do you think all these factors are going to play into, you know, the, the communication style of your, you know, of the company, Bottle? Possibly. What I would say is that there's many very authoritative and experienced and well-followed individuals that are talking about these topics and we, we want to remain bipartisan to the extent that we're providing a service for people to deposit and use their Satoshis, their Bitcoin and we can communicate, we can share information, we can share the, some of the educational content and we should definitely do that. But whether we believe that it's good to generate that content and that that educational information ourselves or whether we could refer people to more established sources of, of this kind of information, that remains to be seen. But that is a big part of the mass adoption narrative will be for people to understand why they even need to use Bitcoin in the first place. Why is that advantageous? What is currently not ideal with the current financial system so there is a huge amount of information to learn when you're getting into bitcoin for the first time but it's an ongoing debate about whether we will actually be the producers of that content or whether we will align ourselves with other authoritative sources of that of that content so but i definitely agree that most people that will come to bitcoin will do it because they're aware of some of the current limitations of our financial system and, and they're curious to understand some of the alternatives. Great. Any countries or languages that have priorities for you guys now? Or what's the roadmap? So at the moment we're mainly developing in, in English and our, and our content and our website are mainly in English but we're aware of the need to make it available on a global scale so we're implementing some technologies which will translate our Dash, translate our website because principally in the short term, the need for these technologies will, will not necessarily be in English speaking countries. In, in Western economies, largely West, uh, English speaking countries, most people are using this technology as a form of investment or as a form of speculation. It's not a necessity for us in our everyday lives. We have relatively stable currencies. We have relatively stable governments. So in the short term, probably the main use of this technology will be in places like South America or in countries like Iran, where they have unstable currencies, they have unpredictable political regimes. Sanctions, embargoes. Right? Yeah, yeah, so it's a case of appealing to a wider audience, but also understanding that a lot of, in the short term, crypto, uh, Bitcoin, I don't like to use the term crypto because mm. we're a Bitcoin company. <laughs> will probably gain traction principally in the countries where it's more of a necessity than a, than a luxury like exactly. it is it like yeah. it is for us in the uk or the usa or canada or any of those countries so awesome Peter. there's definitely a roadmap to roll it out yeah. globally yeah. No, i'm a huge fan of yours man i mean this is this is what is needed in this space now um yeah, any final thoughts or you know advice where people can find you read or watch videos or just educate themselves due diligence Sure. Thank you. So we're, us, us as a company, BottlePay, we're on Twitter at BottlePay. We're also on Instagram at Bottle.Pay. We recently became the first lightning brand, like lightning Bitcoin company to integrate, sending Satoshis over the Instagram wow. network, which was a huge integration. There's, there's still, it's still in the early phases, but the fact that we've gone one step closer to making Satoshis the currency of Facebook and Instagram, instead of Libra is already a, a big step forward and that's got, that's gained some really good traction. Like you said, Matt O'Dell has come on board as an advisor. 
we have a number of innovations coming. So in terms of information, the, the number, if you look up the, the Baltic Honey Badger schedule here, you can look back and you can see an incredible number of talks on the, li on the live stream, on the backup of the live stream, talking about wallets, talking about macroeconomic subjects, talking about the financial system. To, so I would suggest the, the conference we're actually at now, the Baltic Honey Badger 2019, organized by Hoddle Hoddle, which is excellent. Thank you, guys. Thank you. If you look back on the live stream, the recordings, and you'll get a good education and insight into the philosophy and, and the economic factors, the tailwinds. Murad's talk was, was yeah. fascinating. Yeah, yeah there was um, Pierre's talk was amazing. There were, there were just a number of great speakers, great panels. So Matt O'Dell's panel was awesome. There was a wallet panel where there were a number of, we really like what a, mem a number of the other companies in this space are doing. Like we're all for supporting other companies. It's all about mass adoption. So we're not perceiving it as a, com a competitive thing. Like we're more about collaborating and yeah. exactly and complementing each other, bringing knowledge and skills yeah. to what each other are doing. So any, any, anyone who's been here at the conference and wants to reach out and is, is interested in collaboration should definitely do that. I'm interested. I want to be the creative communications director, but I'm <laughs> just kidding. Okay, now we just reserve ourselves a bottle of beer. Thank you so much, yes. Peter. Um, I hope we can do this, uh, you know, continue this either one on one or in maybe even a panel discussion, you know, because sure. I think it needs to be more fruitful discussions going on and it's about really a learning a comprehension process. So thanks so much. Good luck to thanks you guys. You're going to do this. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.